So with that, uh, I'd like to convene the 5,537th meeting of the Rotary Club of Chicago. Everyone is now in session. And uh, we're just gonna get right, get right into it right now. And I'm gonna hand the floor over to one of our newest members, Donna Mitos, to give us the thought of the day. Donna, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'm gonna talk a little bit about gratitude. I'm gonna start with a quote by William Arthur Ward. Gratitude can transform common days into thanksgivings, routine jobs into joy, and change ordinary opportunities into blessings. Now, the dictionary defines gratitude as a quality of being thankful, readiness to show appreciation for and to return kindness. It's a positive emotional state in which one recognizes and appreciates what one has received in life. It's a turning of our mind to focus on what is good, not necessarily perfect, but good. And research shows that taking the time to experience gratitude can make us happier, more successful, and even healthier. Just like everything in life, the more we practice, the better we get. Consider gratitude as something to learn. So the more we find things to be grateful for, the more we'll search to find them. There's, there's a bunch of steps that you can take that we can implement to help us incorporate this practice in a daily life so it becomes a habit. Keep in mind that according to the European Journal of Psychology, a habit takes on average 66 days. Now, it won't take you 66 days to notice the difference here. It'll be much quicker than that if you start practicing some of the gratitude habits. So number one habit that I'm gonna recommend is to start a gratitude journal in the morning or evening. Pick three things, small little things that you're grateful for that happen throughout the day. You know, remembering to bring an umbrella when it's raining out or the feeling of the sun on your face as you're walking down the street. Number two is to thank at least one person every day by text, by mail, a hug. Number three is to find gratitude in failures and challenges. So if you flip um, these into potential growth opportunities, then you'll learn from them and it'll help you appreciate where you are now. Number four is to practice mindfulness and, and um, think about being grateful in the present. So you can journal those later if you want, but think about it five minutes a day in the present. Number five is to stop comparing yourself in life. Be happy for what you have instead of what you lack. Six is to notice the beauty in nature. Seven is to smile more often. Eight is to help others, which I know everyone at Rotary is very familiar with that, and that's why this is such a great organization. And then nine is not worry if you forget to do something. One of these steps, you can just catch up the next day. And then in addition to those steps, there's three steps that you can do that, I, that I've copied from Leading with Gratitude by Chester Eldridge and Adrian Gostick, which will help you in the workplace. And number one is to walk in their shoes, whether it's your employer or your employee. Um, number two is look for small wins instead of just the end result. And number three is to tailor to the individual. Um, everyone is different. And if we figure out what motivates them, we'll be better able to um, be personalize our gratitude with them. So soon you're going to find out that training your coworkers, employees, employees is going to encourage them to act in ways that they may not have in their job description, like welcoming new employees and helping each other more. So by conscientiously practicing gratitude, we can train our brain for happiness and success and work in daily life. So, so what are you waiting for? Thank you very much, Donna. Um, and I'm going to practice it right now by saying we are very thankful to have you as a new member of Rotary One. Uh, so thanks for that wonderful talk. Um, very good. Um, and speaking of how to be better in business and with your employees, uh, we have uh, one of our favorite guests uh, with us today. Um, he is the VP of Public Relations for the Better Business Bureau. Uh, Mr. Tom Johnson, I'm handing the floor over to you. Thank you, Eric. Got it. And uh, big thumbs up on Donna's speech. For the record, I'm on day 183 of my gratitude journal. 
So uh, that's my highest number ever, by the way. So uh, COVID has allowed more focus at working remotely. So, but that's not what I'm here to talk about today. Uh, I really appreciate the partnership with Rotary. Uh, Rotary is a very, very vital, important organization. BBB is a company based on business ethics and trust in the marketplace. And so the synergies between the two organizations are really fabulous. We have a thing called the Torch Awards, uh, the Torch Awards for Marketplace Trust and Ethics, and it's one of the best business brand building awards that a business can win. And uh, we really want to urge everyone in Rotary with a business or someone that you want to uh, get involved to enter this contest. We have Rotary members as judges, very important judges of this contest, and uh, we really would love uh, for you to enter. It's free to enter. Um, and it's an amazing award to win. A huge component of winning this award is, uh, is community service. It's literally about a third of the grade, and it's almost always the big factor in a tiebreaker, like who's going to win the torch. We only give 10 of these out a year, and uh, so community service. So I feel like, I feel like Rotary businesses are almost ringers in this contest because everything that you do fits right into uh, the judging criteria. So, um, so we have three new categories this year. We do it by employee size. It starts out uh, one to nine, then 10 to 50, and goes all the way up to 2,500 plus. We have small winners, big winners, and uh, we added three new categories this year, women and minority owned business owners, and also associations. And we split out the women owned and operated, and we also made it minority owned and operated. We thought that was an important award to start uh, really honoring people with. And uh, we also have a fire starter, which is for young companies coming out of incubators. And it's really a cool award. So the deadline to enter is October the 9th. Um, also, uh, if, if you want to enter your company, please, please do. If you have any questions, uh, you can reach out to me. I'm Tom Johnson, and it's tjohnson at chicago.bbb.org. And uh, the website to enter is bbbtorch.org. And you'll find all kinds of information up there. So I would love to have people in this room uh, enter your contest or enter your business. And uh, if you can't enter your business, uh, urge someone else to. It'd be great. It'd be great to have Rotary members collecting the hardware when we have the live uh, broadcast on December the 9th. Thank you very much, Tom. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, and for folks that are interested, you're also welcome to put something into the, the chat box. Uh, we'll make sure you get connected. You can email myself or uh, anybody uh, at CAM, and we will make sure that you get connected with Tom and that you know the website uh, where you can enter, particularly in this time during COVID-19. Um, I think it's uh, critical for business networking, for getting your business out there to be part of something like this. Uh, thank you very much, Tom, for, for being thank on. You. We'll make sure to continue to get the word out. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, very good. And um, in a very, very similar vein uh, and with very similar purpose, uh, we have started something called the Rotary Network here in our Rotary District and our district to the north, uh, focused on professional networking, focused on trying to connect people with jobs and, um, and furthering their, their career skills. And so uh, I do wanna hand the floor over to Marshall Schmidt to tell us a little bit more about that and make any requests you may have. Yeah. Thank you very much, Eric. I think many of you have heard me speak about the Rotary Network before. Uh, we set it up as a way for Rotarians to help Rotarians in this troubled economic time. And there's one aspect of it that I want to highlight as the, the economic news continues to be uh, fairly grim uh, when it comes to the job loss that has been caused by the pandemic. Uh, a, a major part of the, the Rotary Network, which you can find at the rotarynetwork.org, is uh, our career services. And what this really does and what it's designed to do is to help people who are out of work at this time or, or who are interested in uh, finding another position uh, to do that. We have uh, enlisted the help of several uh, career services organizations who are offering uh, very special deals uh, on their services to help people uh, find jobs. So 
if you find yourself uh, without a job or that you're looking for another position, uh, please feel free to reach out. During this time, what we're finding is that a lot of people who have lost their jobs are really reluctant to acknowledge that fact. So if you're aware of anyone who needs, any Rotarian who needs these services, please direct them to the Rotary Network. Uh, we've created this to help people like that, to help Rotarians like that. And we, we really, really want people to use it. So I'm here to encourage you to, uh, to reach out uh, to your friends and if you need those services. Again, you can find it all at the Rotary Network Dot org. If you have any questions whatsoever about the network, please feel free to contact me. I will put my email and address and phone number in the chat box. Thank you very much, Eric. Thank you, Marshall. Um, and after hearing your talk and Tom's talk, uh, I'm thinking there may be resources at the Better Business Bureau, too, that we want to make sure are connected uh, into the Rotary Network. Um, so that could be worth um, both you guys uh, having a, a chat here at some point in the not too distant future. Very good. Um, well, uh, let's move right into our program, shall we? Again, as we go through the program, make sure you're on mute. And if you have any questions, do put them in the chat box and we'll try to get to as many of them as possible at the, at the end of the, the program. Uh, but for now, uh, I am going to hand the floor over to our program's co-chair, Mr. David Hirsch. David, the floor is yours. Eric, thank you. <clears throat> it's my privilege to introduce my friend, John Crowley. John is the CEO and founder of Amicus Therapeutics, a $3 billion value global biotech research firm that does research on rare disease, 500 plus employees in 30 countries around the world. John was born and raised in New Jersey. Sadly, his father, a New Jersey police officer and also Marine veteran, uh, died in the line of duty uh, when John was just eight years old. His mom raised him and his younger brother, and through some diligence and hard work, um, he got through the Naval Academy. Uh, he graduated from Georgetown. He went to University of Notre Dame Law School, and if that wasn't enough, he also graduated from Harvard Business School. So he's got this amazing pedigree. Uh, but in addition to his business accomplishments and his education, uh, John and his wife, Aileen, have three children, uh, three children with special needs, I might add. John Jr., who has ADHD and Asperger's, and Megan and Patrick, who were both diagnosed with Pompeii disease. Well, that helped John focus his time and energies into finding a cure uh, for Pompeii disease. And through some hard work and, I think, divine intervention, uh, he led the effort to find a cure for Pompeii disease. And while Megan and Patrick are in wheelchairs and on ventilators, um, they are living thriving lives. Um, I know a little bit more about Megan, so I'll brag on her so John doesn't have to. But uh, Megan graduated from University of Notre Dame, I guess it would be going on two years ago. And he, excuse me, she um, is now a graduate student at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, the story is a well-told one. There was an investigative reporter wrote some stories in the Wall Street Journal, which morphed into a book entitled The Cure. It caught the attention of Harrison Ford, who options the rights to the book to make the movie Extraordinary Measures, which Harrison Ford starred in, by the way, not as John Crowley. And uh, John ended up writing a memoir uh, entitled Chasing Miracles. It's my pleasure to introduce my friend, John Crowley. John, the stage is yours. Dave, thank you. It's great to see you. And, and thanks for the opportunity to speak to everybody here in Chicago. Uh, you know, it's interesting when you think about our family's journey and what we do in biotechnology, particularly amicus, focused on rare genetic diseases, devastating disorders for kids. And I think about what Rotary is all about, about service, about community. And you look at, you know, you are all well familiar with and live as, as part of your mission in life the Rotarian's mission to rid the world of disease, and in particular, the, the strong connection with the immunization of people around the world, children in particular, against polio. Um, there, there are many, many common paths and journeys uh, here, um, but I think more than anything, an underlying sense of purpose and 
the combination really of, of your business life and your personal life. We used to think, certainly pre-COVID, that we had a work-life balance. There was work and there was life. I think increasingly we realize it's work-life integration. Um, for many of us, for many years, that's been part of the principles by which we live. So I think, I, David, again, thank you for that um, really, really kind introduction. It's the t type of introduction that my daughter, Megan, would usually roll her eyes at. So thank, thank, thank you. She's down the hall actually online doing her classes. She's getting, uh, as David alluded to, a, a master's in social work at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. So I'll, I'll talk more about the kids here in a moment. But what I'd really like to do in, in, in the time we have today is not focus so much on, on what we did over the years. I'll, I'll give just a brief thumbnail of that, but to really share with you a couple of lessons learned for, for me, uh, for my wife, Eileen, and, and for our family of, you know, what have we learned in life as much as in business about this? And where do we see the future going, particularly in this fight against what are now known to be more than 9,000 rare diseases. In fact, if you take all people living with all rare diseases in the United States, that's one out of 10 persons. So more prevalent than all cancers, all HIV combined. And if we unlock the secrets to many of these rare genetic diseases, we will help understand how to treat much more prevalent disorders. In fact, increasingly, we're realizing that diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's are closely aligned with a number of rare genetic diseases. So many, many reasons to, to do what we do. Um, but if I can, I'll, I'll take you back to the, the kids' diagnosis. I was a year out of business school. I had finished all those schools that, that David had talked about, was in my early 30s. And for many of those schools, I acquired a pretty good amount of student loans along the way. And, but we were starting out life and you know, we had a plan and then uh, nature and chance intervened. And we learned uh, the day that my, uh, seven days after my Patrick was born, Patrick was born March 6th, 1998. We learned seven days later on a Friday the 13th that his older sister, Megan, who was only 15 months old, we had gotten the results back on her, that she had this rare form of muscular dystrophy known as Pompe disease. My wife and I are silent carriers. Any one of us are carriers for, on average, perhaps a dozen rare genetic diseases, but not until you generally have a baby with somebody who's also a carrier do the symptoms of a disease manifest. And for many of these disorders, even then, there's only a one in four chance that two carriers coming together would have a child. For Pompe disease, that was about a one in 40,000 chance of having a child with Pompe. We learned that day that um, the disease was serious. The doctor actually told us Megan wouldn't live to be but a couple of years old. It was very, very little research and there was nothing that could be done. And he told us there was a one in four chance that Patrick at seven days old could also have the disease and we needed to get him tested. And we did shortly after that. So in a very short period of time, we went from having a plan in life to life dramatically changing. And um, we went through a lot of emotions, the shock, the, the grief, the anger, the denial, and, and pretty quickly settled on determination. I, I think first determined to learn everything we could about this, this, uh, this disease. And then pretty quickly determined to do anything we could to try to extend or enhance the kids' lives. And we came to know many other families living with this disease and ultimately, of course, many, many, many other people living with other rare genetic disorders. And I, again, I, I won't go through much of what we did, but we went from starting a small not-for-profit, literally bake sales, raising a couple hundred bucks to fundraisers with the Muscular Dystrophy Association, uh, all the way to finally being frustrated, realizing as the kids were getting sicker, um, as they were unable to walk, as they required ventilators to breathe, um, that time was the enemy as much as, as this disease was. And so really, because I think partly because we didn't have much to lose and, and partly because we didn't want to look back years later and wished we had done something more. So I left at that point, I was working at Bristol Myers in the, in the marketing department and left that job and the security, the health insurance and worked with a researcher to start a small business to develop a medicine with for 
people living with Pompeii, and in Pompeii, the kids are missing an enzyme, one out of maybe 100,000 or so enzymes that we all make all day, every day. It, with missing that one enzyme, because of a single mutation on one gene, the kids couldn't break down sugar in their muscles. So we needed to invent an enzyme replacement therapy, something that would be delivered every other week um, to, to the children. Um, so a pretty tall order. There was some very early science at Duke University, uh, at the University of Oklahoma, and we partnered with one of those Oklahoma scientists. And we went from those bake sales to starting that company, the first money in the company, actually the first payroll. Um, we met um, funded by the prestigious venture capital firms of Visa and MasterCard. So you're not a true entrepreneur if you haven't met a payroll um, with a cash advance on your credit card. So we, we began that way. And then um, Eileen and I had a home uh, here in New Jersey and we took a home equity loan on the house, about $100,000, all the equity we had in the house to fund the business for a few more months and eventually did attract venture capital and advanced science and built, began to build a business. We went from a handful of us to over 100 people. Eventually we sold that business to the world's, at the time, the world's largest rare disease company sold that company for a couple of hundred million dollars. And it brought to us enormous resources to advance the science. And thankfully, uh, Megan and Patrick became the 28th and 29th children in the world on January 9th, 2003, what would have been my dad's 63rd birthday. Um, they received that life-saving enzyme therapy. By that point, their hearts are about three times normal size, the left side of their heart. Within 12 weeks, their hearts remodeled and went back to normal size for a while it made them stronger and we thought we were done and i i left biotechnology and and you know that was kind of our three years of a very intense focus of of making a medicine but i realized about a year later after the kids strength had plateaued and we were starting to see signs of of regression even that um, what we had done is was to invent a medicine that fixed their hearts and for their muscle strength made them stronger for a while, but we needed to do much better. I also realized through this journey just how much, you know, how many people lived with rare diseases, how much suffering there was, particularly in children. And what I wanted to do then was to start another company, one that wouldn't be a sprint, but it would be a long, long, life, lifelong marathon to make medicines for people living with rare genetic diseases. And so a handful of us started this company, Amicus Therapeutics, and have made now um, multiple medicines for people living with rare diseases. And as David mentioned as well, we've grown this company now from five people to over 500. Uh, we have operations in 27 countries. We have an approved medicine that'll generate um, about $250 million in sales this year. Um, and that will help fund our pipeline, uh, now the largest pipeline of medicines for people living with rare diseases, over 50 programs in development for 50 different rare genetic diseases. Um, it has not been a straight line journey at Amicus in the 15 years of doing this, um, but I think we're finally in the last year or two at that inflection point where we can look and, 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 and really begin to fulfill that ultimate vision. And I think, um, you know, we really wanted to make sure that we dreamed big, that we never looked back and thought that we thought too small. Um, so with that as kind of a primer, and, and David, as he's, you know, uh, mentioned in his very kind introduction, the medicine did save the kids' lives. It gave us a chance to invent what could be the next best medicine in Pompeii. And we have that in late clinical development. It's taken more than a decade of science to come up with an even better medicine. Uh, our kids have been on that medicine in a clinical trial for a couple of years. It's, it's enhanced their strength for my Megan significantly. It's part of what enabled her to get through Notre Dame. Um, and it's, you know, again, kind of just a, a stepping stone to what could be the next best and hopefully finally a cure with a gene therapy we have in very early development in our company at our research labs in Philadelphia. So I thought just a couple of thoughts on, on lessons learned here. One is persistence. Um, you know, we all know we, we have to be tenacious and persistent in life generally, certainly in our businesses. We've all seen the curveball that 
nature has thrown us with this COVID experience. Um, some businesses have been devastated. Some have thrived. Um, but that notion of persistence is incredibly important. When I started that first biotech company, um, it was out in Oklahoma. I lived here in New Jersey. I'd commute back and forth every week to Oklahoma City. That first week or so, my mom sent me a nice little encouraging note I got in the mail. I had a small little office and I had a family picture, the only picture in my office. And with that, she actually included a little brass plaque. It was a bookmark from Barnes and Noble. And it was a quote from Winston Churchill that said, never, never, never quit. Um, and I can't tell you how many times over the years in trying to make medicines for Pompeii and, and other diseases, where I thought about quitting, where I thought it was too hard, we were taking too much of a risk. There were people way more talented than me to do this. Um, I thought about the sacrifice of all the time away from kids and family, particularly before we had a medicine when Megan and Patrick's lives could have been really, really short. Um, and I would have missed a good part of that. But many, many times I'd kind of look at that plaque in my office and think, you know what, I, we need to do this. Um, if we don't, who else will? I also have uh, in my office here in Princeton, um, and there's a great historical connection with Rotary. I, uh, my brother-in-law many years ago gave me a Christmas gift and it was a framed black and white photo of Dr. Jonas Salk. And he had a nice little plaque underneath it, uh, kind of a motivational saying that my brother-in-law had written. And, um, and he gave it to me. And I, I knew a little bit about Dr. Salk and the work he had done on discovering a vaccine, uh, the polio vaccine. But I did some more research. Um, and it's really a remarkable story in persistence. You know, originally he received funding from the Infantile Paralysis Foundation, what we now call the March of Dimes. Originally, to study the epidemiology, just understand how many people could have polio. And then eventually that led to funding for a research grant for a vaccine. Um, the first studies with that vaccine were an absolute abject failure, to the point where Dr. Salk went uh, one day, and he, he was interviewed, ironically, a magazine called Wisdom in the mid-1950s, and it reflected back on that, those failures. And he said he went to a park one day. And he sat on a bench and he thought he was done. His research didn't work. And he was thinking about, how, you know, how does he share that with his, his teammates, with the people who funded him, with his family? And then he looked out, he said, and he saw children playing in a playground. And it really struck him that many of those children could one day contract polio. Some may even die. And he said in, in that moment, he realized the enormity of the importance of his work. And he said, so with that, in that moment, he decided to press on, to go back and try again. And he said he went back with what he called a renewed vigor. Um, eventually, without Dr. Saw, the world would have had a vaccine, but it would have taken longer. You know, and how many people would have suffered and died in that world? So I think for me, it's a, it's a, it's a great lesson in persistence and endurance, resiliency, and in remembering sometimes you are in that moment. And while you may think there are others better suited and maybe on paper they are, um, sometimes you have to be that person or your team has to be that team that does something pretty special. The other, uh, the other lesson for me is, is, is one of optimism. And uh, you know, I thought it was great to hear about gratitude in the beginning. And that's all part of, I think, what we've learned in life. You know, there, there were times where um, you know I could get pretty down and think you know, I, you know nature is is um, not cruel, just brutally random and kind of, you know why did this happen to us or to our kids and you can kind of you know drift in that woefulness or you can finally say I'm going to do something about it, but also too there's an element of gratefulness. I I didn't know in fact early on I never expected that we may succeed. I just didn't want to have any regrets and, and very quickly began to appreciate the time that we had. All those small moments, sometimes they get lost in the day to day. And we've had some great teachers along the way and, and maybe the best teachers I think have been our kids, Patrick and Megan. Megan, again, you know, obviously remarkable. Pompeii disease never affects the mind. You know, Megan did, did remarkably well in high school 
well enough to get into every university she applied to and and thankfully to uh we were able to have her up in south bend at, at notre dame and uh, but but it wasn't easy and there were times where it was really tough for her and what we had this routine when she was young she'd come strolling into our bathroom here i'd be getting ready it was always crazy hectic you know and just the extra you know the extra time it takes to to take care of special needs children um and then somehow we thought it was a good idea to throw two jack russell terriers in the mix so we always had a busy house in the morning and we always had this routine where megan would come rolling in in her wheelchair and i would ask her as i was getting ready megan how are you today and no matter how she actually really felt, whether she was had a cold she had to deal with or a test that she was struggling with, uh, something in school, she would always give me the same one word answer. Awesome. She'd say, I'm awesome. How are you? And I have to tell you, if, if you took Megan or somebody like her and, and you saw her walking down this or rolling down the street in her wheelchair, um, you'd notice her. And if, I think if I asked you to write a hundred adjectives, um, you may write beautiful, inspiring, but I don't know that anybody would write awesome. But, you know, the way that Megan views her and her own life. In fact, she wrote in a freshman paper at Notre Dame, an autobiography, um, in a small seminar she had taught by Father Monk Malloy, who was the university president when I was there. Um, every kid has to write an autobiography in Monk's seminar. It's supposed to be seven pages. Megan wrote 39 pages. She had a lot to say at 18 years old. Um, and one thing she wrote, and when Eileen and I read that, we were taken aback, although we probably shouldn't have been. She wrote that she would never change her life and want to not have Pompe disease. And she said, you know, this is who I am. This is the way God made me. She said, sure, I wish I could do more things and I hope I live a long, full life. Um, maybe a little less struggle along the way would be nice. She said, but, you know, there are, there are gifts that come with this. There are gifts, she said, that she has learned through her own adversity. And this is a kid who's been through untold surgeries, hospital stays, PICUs, uh, you know, God knows how many times her heart has stopped, uh, you know, all the challenges that we, most of us could never imagine. Um, but she said, you know, all the people too that are in her life, most all of them, she wouldn't know if this wasn't kind of the way nature and destiny um, had chosen for her and that she was forever grateful. So that notion of gratefulness, I think is a very relevant one and, and I think a, a very important lesson for us. Another important lesson is in running a business um, is the notion of social responsibility. I, I think about what Rotary is, is all about. Um, you know, you, we all work very hard running our businesses and earning a livelihood for our families to provide means for our families, independence, security, all the reasons that we work and to, to build something special. But when we started Amicus, we wanted to build something special. You know, even in, in choosing the name, we picked the Latin word um, for friend, Amicus. We wanted to be the most patient-focused, patient-friendly company in all of pharmaceuticals and biotech. We um, have, I'll give you some examples of, of how we live that. Um, you know, every biotech company has a scientific advisory board or medical advisory boards, and we have those. We also have patient advisory boards for every single disease that we work in. Patients that we bring in under confidentiality agreements, we share with them anything and everything that we're doing. They've never breached that confidentiality. It builds a relationship, it builds a trust, and for us, it really builds an understanding so that we can make better medicines. Um, again, we, with the chief patient advocate in the company, we have a C-suite level executive who reports directly to me, sits on my executive committee. We were the first company to have a department of patient advocacy 15 years ago. And seven years ago, we were the first company to have a chief patient advocate. Um, I'm proud to say Pfizer and Merck now have chief patient advocates. So to understand that patient perspective, we've also realized that we have, you know, what we do in, in biotech really is different. Um, there are so many noble pursuit, so many products and services that are important to a vibrant uh, and free economy. Um, but what we do in making medicines comes with a special obligation. It really is, I believe, an extension of the practice of medicine. And much as doctors and nurses um, 
you know, have taken a solemn oath to help the sick, we're really providing them with those tools. And I think we need to take a similar oath. And so with that, we have an obligation not only to make great medicines that are safe and effective, um, we have an obligation to ensure 100% access, that everybody who needs a medicine has access to that. And for us at Amicus, that meant 15 years ago in our company valued statement, we wrote that our medicines must be fairly priced and broadly accessible. And I'm pleased that we have never had a single patient in the world denied access to our medicine. And in those small, rare cases when they were, we give it for free to anyone, anywhere. We also made a pledge to anyone coming into our clinical studies. Uh, if they come into an amicus clinical study, we guarantee them that drug for life, not for a one-year study period. Um, these are the things, you know, I've asked everybody in our company to think if, if you had a disease or if you were the parent of a child with a disease, how would you act? How would you make decisions? Who would you hire? Where would you build a plant? When would you start a program? When would you stop a program? And it really builds a foundation for the company that makes a better, stronger, more sustainable business. It's not only the right thing to do, um, it's actually the right thing to do to make the best business that we can. So I'm a firm believer in the notion of stakeholder capitalism that we need. We have an obligation to shareholders. We have an obligation to our communities, to our families, to regulators, you know, a number of different stakeholders. But for us at the center of that, has to be patients, people living with these diseases. And we really try to live that every day. I'll end with this uh, last thought on lessons learned and then happy Eric or others to, to take any questions. But I think one important lesson for us through all of this is the importance of time. And I realized that really what we were fighting for is, is just time. When we went public, uh, Amicus, in uh, a while ago now, May of 2007, um, it was a very well-received IPO. We, uh, as hard as it was to raise money for my first company, we were really successful with the second company. Uh, and if you know, for a for an entrepreneur, an IPO is a pretty significant mark of success, of course. And for us, um, you know, we had Morgan Stanley and Merrill Lynch and Goldman Sachs, all the big banks taking us public. Um, you go around and you do these IPO roadshows, um, they're mind numbing, it's the same meeting about 80 times over with investors, mutual funds, hedge funds, or pension funds around the United States, Canada, Europe. Uh, the banks put you on these big private jets to jet you around. I'd never been on a private plane, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and we come back to New York and the book was eight times oversubscribed. We were looking to raise $75 million in our IPO we could have raised over a half a billion. We kept it at 75 million, um, really successful IPO. We actually celebrated that day. We had a board meeting and then I bust, we were about 70 people or so in the company then. I bust everybody up from Princeton, New Jersey into New York. We closed the stock exchange, the NASDAQ. I was on CNBC that day, did a bunch of newspaper interviews, had a great big party and balloons. I gave a talk to the company and I, uh, I told them, you know, great work. This is a stepping stone. Um, you know, have a great time tonight. We got your hotel room, stay here, and I hope to see you <laughs> come back to work soon. Um, but I, uh, it was a great celebration. It was a moment in time, but I, I went home that night. I was, um, I was tired, it had been a long two weeks. And I think, you know, like many of you, work, travel until COVID was, um, you know, a necessary burden of, of work and it was a sacrifice. And I think like many of you, I did, you know, what most moms and dads do after a business trip. And I went in and checked on the kids and the boys sleep pretty soundly. So Patrick and John, I, I gave them a kiss and they didn't stir. And, and then I went into our, uh, our Megan's room and she's a light sleeper and I gave her a kiss and she threw her arms up and said, daddy, I said, Megs, give me a hug. So I gave her a hug and uh, she asked, she said, daddy, she said, I, well, she said, I missed you. I said, I missed you too. And then she asked, how was your big business trip? And I said, well, Megan, I said, you'd be pretty proud of the old man. We did really well. And, you know, I still had my suit on, the whole thing. And, and she said, uh, I know, Daddy, I saw you on TV today. And so I asked, I said, well, Megan, how did I look? And she said, well, then I'm all of about five, six on a good day. And she said, well, Daddy, she said, honestly, you looked really, really. And I felt pretty good about that day, right? So I'm thinking, I don't know, powerful, or she, she said, Daddy, you looked really, really short. 
And then there was this kind of awkward silence. And um, she said, but dad, I like that yellow tie that showed up really well on the TV. So, oh, thanks. So Megan is the master at how to damn with faint praise. And then um, she asked me a question. She said, are you going to be here in the morning? I said, yeah, I'll be here. And she asked, um, would you take me to school? And I said, yes, Megan, I'll take you to school. And she said, awesome. And I love you. I said, I love you. And I stepped out of her room and I realized, first of all, the, the humility of true success, not because the kids had, had te Megan had teased me and they, they teased me all the time. I think it was because I realized in that moment kind of what we were doing, why we were doing what we were doing. And it had been such a race to that point. But I think I realized what we were doing was all about just creating those moments because Megan really truly did not care that I was on TV or what airplane I flew in or how much money we raised. What, what she cared is that her dad was on a really long two week business trip and he was home and, and he was gonna get to take her to school. And I think when we think back on why did we make the medicine, in, in many ways it was just to create for our family and other families like us, more moments like that. And so it's those things that you try to remember and that bring that perspective, even in, even in the toughest of times. So, you know, persistence, optimism, the notion of social responsibility that what we are doing is bigger than us and the importance of time. Um, so with that, there is a, a very, very brief video that the University of Notre Dame put together about a two minute video that captures just a little bit more about uh, Megan, her spirit, and our journey. Megan was 14 months old when she was diagnosed with Pompeii disease. We were told that she wouldn't live to be maybe two years old, so we were most focused on just getting past the next few days and months. We have taught Megan that she is no different from anybody else just because she can't walk or breathe on her own, that doesn't mean she can't do everything, just about anything anybody else can do. She's gotten deeply involved in the Make-A-Wish Club, now the president of the Make-A-Wish Club. The only way that a child could do this is to want to do it themselves. <laughs> When you think about the challenges that Megan lives with every day, we able-bodied people would look at that and think, oh my God, how does she do it? For Megan, I think she looks at it and thinks, how do you not do it? This is my life. Megan is absolutely going to graduate. Megan's going to get a job. She's going to get married. And she's going to have children. And she will tell you the exact same thing. <laughs> Anyway, it gives you a little bit of Megan and Eileen in our, our journey and certainly Megan's journey through Notre Dame. So thanks for listening. Um, happy to take any questions. Well, John, uh, on behalf of the uh, Rotary Club of Chicago, uh, that was an amazing presentation. Thank you so much uh, for sharing. Um, John mentioned that uh, Amicus Therapeutics is a publicly traded company for those that are interested. The symbol is F-O-L-D, FOLD. And uh, I might mention selfishly that John is one of now more than 100 dads that I've interviewed for the Special Fathers Network Dad to Dad podcast. I've included a link in the, sh in the chat. So for anybody who's interested in taking a little bit deeper dive on John's story, you can find it there. I also put uh, links to the books that I made reference to earlier. Um, John is the epitome of why I've been saying for years and years and years, some of the best parenting that I've witnessed is in the special needs community. So thanks again for sharing, John. I'll just uh, ask one brief question. And because it's all things COVID going on right now, I'm wondering if there's any insights you can share as a leader in the biotech research area uh, that might help us put this in perspective and not be distracted by what I think of as all the noise. Um, and maybe it's because it's the political season that it is, but to create a realistic expectation for what might transpire. 
Yeah, no, I think, it, you know, this will be, I have 100% confidence this will be grounded in science and data. You know, you think about where we, we've come from through COVID, David, I think you look on the therapeutic side, you look at the practice of medicine, it's evolved to the point where now um, we are going to see, we're maybe even beginning to see it now, a resurgence of the pandemic in the fall. Every pandemic in the history of mankind that's transmissible in this fashion has seen a resurgence, a second wave. So we will likely see that how severe and how long it lasts, we will find out. Um, I'm really optimistic though, I have to tell you, I, I've been involved in a lot of the, I serve on the industry board, so we're pretty actively involved with the Operation Warp Speed effort. And I can tell you that you know we will see the mortality rate much, much lower because medicine has really evolved in the last six months to understand where to intervene, where not to intervene, what antivirals, what antibodies, you know, will help patients. Convalescent plasma certainly looks like it will to a degree. And then we look, of course, at vaccines. And what we have done is really remarkable. Typically, a vaccine, if it could even be invented, would be five to 10 years of development to get to the market. We will have done this well inside of a year. And, you know, what you don't see is all the background, the manufacturing that's happening. Um, it, I've never seen a better example of public-private partnership here and people putting aside agendas. It really, it's, it's almost like, you know, when we live in the rare disease community, you know, anybody or anybody living in the, in the cancer field, you're constantly thinking about, you know, this notion of time. How do we move as fast as we can? Um, how do we make a great medicine that actually works and that's safe? And how do we get it to everybody? Um, those are all the principles that are underlying what we're doing. So I'm very optimistic with respect to vaccines. We'll have that data here by the end of October through November in the first several vaccines from Moderna, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, a few others, likely based on all the science we see to date, I'm very optimistic that they will be shown to be safe and effective. And then I think depending on the amount of data, anybody, any individual doctor has to look at it through a risk benefit lens. If you are in a high risk category, elderly, you know, compromised immune system, if you're a frontline healthcare worker, the risks are pretty significant. And my, my guess is that the benefits of taking that vaccine sooner rather than later will outweigh any risks. And, uh, you know, uh, month Dr. Salawi, who runs Operation Warp Speed, I, I know well from his days at GSK, is an incredibly talented scientist with zero political agenda. And he ran the vaccines business at Claxo. Um, so he's the right person you want in charge, partnered with a four-star army general. Um, so I'm, you know, he said, Monsef has said publicly between December and February, he believes we'll be able to inoculate, uh, vaccinate 40 million people in the United States. Um, it really everybody in the high risk category and everybody else will have the opportunity for a vaccine kind of from the early part of 21. And he said publicly that he thinks summer vacations will be as they were next summer. So that's, that's unprecedented and God willing the track that we're on. So, but let, let's let data and science determine that. Thank you, John. Back to you, Eric. Thank you very much, David. Um, John, that was an incredible and an inspiring presentation. Um, I, I know we have a couple of good questions in the chat box, but uh, I think we're, we're out of time now, but it was, it was well worth it um, because I see so many comments about how people really loved your, your presentation. Um, and uh, I do want to uh, share with you a, a gift that we are going to send you. Uh, we give to all of our Rotary speakers. Uh, proceeds from these candles go to support an organization called Bright Endeavors, and their mission is to empower young moms by providing transitional jobs and professional skills training. Uh, so this not only helps those young moms, but it also supports their kids, and obviously it supports our, our communities. Um, and uh, we are cer certainly grateful for what you do to support uh, everybody uh, on, on earth with the, uh, the great work that you do. Uh, let's all give John a, uh, a round of applause. Thank you so much. No, thanks for listening, everybody. Good luck to you. Uh, God bless and go Irish. <laughs> thanks for having me. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. And obviously, you're welcome to, to stick around for the, for the rest of our program, if you like. Great. Thank you. Very good. Um, 
so speaking of service to humanity, uh, one of the segments that we've started since our strategic plan is the service spotlight. We have so many service projects going on locally and globally that we want to make sure that our members know about what we've been doing. And uh, so I want to uh, talk a little bit about a project that we have done in Ecuador. And uh, just a reminder that while this segment, uh, we only have about five minutes for this segment, uh, the, the folks who have generously joined the meeting to talk about this are, are gonna stick around after the end of the meeting. So if you have any questions, uh, you can ask those questions then. Um, and so now I'm gonna hand the floor over to our uh, past president, uh, past district governor, uh, past CEO and founder of Premier Engineering, uh, but current all-around great guy, uh, Mr. Pedro Ceballos. Pedro, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Eric, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, good afternoon, uh, our dear friend, Fresia Abad Castro from Ecuador, and also to Michael uh, Moens who, from the Hokotoko Foundation. This is, this is a project that was uh, spearheaded by, uh, by PDG Presiabad, and uh, we want to make this presentation good, quick, and it's, uh, it was the first environmental project done by the Rotary Foundation. The way before, before the, there was an area of focus of the Rotary Foundation, so the first, first environmental project done by the Rotary Foundation. And uh, I think, like, uh, Fresia, we want to say a few words? Presia, or oh, let's go directly to tenía, Michael. Perdón, tenía cerrado el micrófono. Sí, okay. este, ¿qué me preguntabas? Este? Yo sé que digas buenos días nada más. Ah, ya, no, que yo me siento muy contenta de estar aquí en este club con, con ustedes compartiendo esta mañana y que espero que la charla de, de Michael les, les agrade. O sea, Gracias. resuelvan todas sus inquietudes. Mm -hmm. Michael, the, the floor is yours. All right. Um, first, uh, nice to meet you all, and thank you for this uh, this space to uh, to tell about this amazing uh, project in uh, in Ecuador. Uh, my name is um, Michael Michael Muns. Uh, I'm originally from Belgium, but now here I'm sitting in the middle of the world, which is Ecuador, a fantastic country, which obviously was also very, uh, very hit by the COVID crisis. But uh, in the meanwhile, we have been doing a lot of amazing stuff. So uh, I first want to thank uh, Pedro and Pam for visiting us and uh, Fresia, because it's thanks to you, uh, thanks to you that uh, we were able to start this amazing project in Ecuador. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk uh, five minutes about uh, a restoration project about a river watershed in southern Ecuador, which benefits not only uh, biodiversity, but also surrounding communities which suffer from bad water quality. So first, um, I, wanted, I wanted to talk what is Hokotoko Foundation. Uh, you're seeing this bird on the screen. This is the Hokotoko Anpita. It was discovered 20 years ago and it gave rise to a foundation that dedicates uh, every day to protect fauna and flora in Ecuador, right? So uh, our mission is safe endangered fauna and flora here in Ecuador uh, from extinction, but in the meantime, we also work with surrounding communities, so they also benefit from the protection of nature. Um, just to uh, show you some numbers, since 1938, we've lost 98% of the coastal forests of Ecuador. Uh, this shows you a graph till 88, but nowadays um, uh, it's much worse. Every day we are losing 100 soccer fields of primary rainforests in Western Ecuador. So as I speak now, this is happening and COVID has accelerated that. So um, since we began to work in Ecuador, we have created 16 reserves. It is 15 here, but now last August, we created a, a new reserve to protect these beautiful hummingbirds. And so we're working on a nationwide scale. Uh, we have a reserve also in Galapagos Islands. And so um, we work with communities. And so uh, I'm gonna jump directly to the project. Uh, we are in Buenaventura Reserve, which is a nature reserve in southern Ecuador in the Eloro province. And this is kind of like the landscape you see there. You see like these islands of remnant vegetation and then um, these, uh, these uh, farm fields. 
And so uh, these de deforestation has, has cut down so many trees that the water quality has gone down so strongly for surrounding communities. So within Buenaventura Reserve, just to give you an idea, we're talking about a biodiversity hotspot too. There's over 400 bird species in just 2,500 hect hectares. And it's about like 7,500 acres. And if you compare that to the diversity in the, in the United States, it's like half of the bird species of the United States are kind of protected in such a small place. Just to give you an idea of what kind of place we're talking about, right? Um, so I just want to uh, quit. We all know this, but the, the two biggest threats we are facing as humanity are biodiversity loss and climate change. And together, these two threats have also cost our current situation of COVID, right? But nature has given a, a fantastic solution to uh, mitigate climate change and to counteract that biodiversity, le biodiversity loss, which are the trees themselves. Trees are able to do this chemical process of photosynthesis where they take CO2 from the atmosphere and convert it to oxygen. Nature has given, given us a, this solution and this is why with the project uh, with Rotary Club Chicago and Rotary Club Machala, this is a pioneering restoration project. It's a reforestation project where, uh, where we're reforesting trees, right? Tokotoko uh, before has planted 1.6 million native trees, restoring 1,600 hectares from pasture to, for, uh, to forest. And this is important because this is why we've partnered with, uh, with the Rot Rotary Club, right? This is an image which is very, very uh, typical from the south of Ecuador. At one side of the river, you have a pristine forest, which is part of our reserve. And then the other side is just a pasture, which is grass and cattle, right? We, in this project, Oops. Oh, it looks like we may be having some technical want to restore here. that patient. Okay, sorry. Uh, are you guys still hearing me? Uh, yeah, not now we are. You were uh, breaking up there for a few minutes, okay. for a few seconds. I'm, so, I'm sorry. Um, so uh, we signed uh, uh, a new uh, fantastic project in October last year with the Rotary, Rotary Club from, uh, from Machala and thanks to the support of the Rotary Club of, of uh, Chicago, we were able to start a reforestation project uh, in Buenaventura. And this is a photo from when Pedro and, uh, and, and Pam visited us uh, this year. And um, the, objective, the objective of this project is restoring 30 hectares with 13,000 native trees. And also aside doing workshops with the local communities on water management and agroforestry. So the benefits are we are gonna restore water quality and quantity for the communities. We're gonna conserve endangered fauna and flora and we're gonna mitigate climate change to the capture of CO2 uh, to these trees, right? Um, so uh, this, uh, I'm going to jump to this, but the project is working on 30 hectares, but basically it's going to benefit an area of 15,000 hectares, which is about like 50,000 acres. Um, and to give you a, a, a specific example, 2,820 people of the Sarakai community will benefit from clean water uh, from this project, thanks to the restoration project. But what, we, what did we do during the project, the, the, during this last year, during the, the, the pandemic? We collected native seeds from the forest remnants, we grow them in a nursery, and then we plant them. This is the, the, this is the specific spot where the Rotary Club project is going on. So what we are doing is um, making these reforestation lanes and then planting 30,000 trees. We've done this. Um, uh, it was a, it was hard work during COVID with the biosecurity protocols and everything, but we made it. Um, so basically, uh, at the left side, you can see this, this pasture, which we have to like kind of get rid of to get plant native trees again. And so, what is important here? The, this project is um, is is a five year project, and why? This is because every two months after planting the trees, we need to go back and cut down all these invasive grasses. If not, we lose the trees, right? So aside from that, we've been doing intensive monitoring fauna flora, the monitoring of the trees. And nowadays, you can see this graph, which shows you the 27 species, native species we've planted. 
and their tree height. They're all about uh, in between uh, 50 centimeters high and two meters. And so every two months, we're measuring this again, see how, uh, to understand how, many, how much CO2 it captures, and in the meantime, see on the long term how we can restore uh, the water quality for the communities, right? This is uh, an interesting graph. Um, we are able to georeference every tree for the people that are donating for this project. So for example, you can also like uh, um, become, uh, what, in Spanish they say apadrinar a tree. We can like uh, adopt a tree, right? And see where it, where it is growing with the GPS, GPS points, et cetera. Um, so just to give you an idea, uh, we just started this project, but on the right side, you see a drone picture from Buenaventura project and in the polygon, in the red polygon, this used to be pasture 20 years ago. And this is how it looks like today. It's again a forest. So it shows that on a relatively short time frame, we can really make a difference for, uh, to restore our forests in, uh, in, in Ecuador. I just quickly want to finish uh, this presentation. Sorry if I, I talked a little bit more than five minutes, but we are now launching a new project to uh, plant 9 million trees in all of Ecuador, which will have a very strong community component because we're gonna plant the trees with people from the communities. And so in any case, it just shows like the Rotary uh, project is a very, um, like very, very important project to start uh, this, to, to work with the local community so we can really start to dream big and to uh, save the forest from Ecuador and restore um, uh, watersheds in, in the country. Uh, besides that, I wanted to thank you, the, uh, the Rotary Club of Chicago, the Rotary Club of uh, Machala, and uh, all these people that you see on the screen, which is uh, part of Fundacion Jocotoco, and these are the guys which every day during the COVID crisis have been working to make this project su successful. So thank you very much for, for your time and uh, I, I will be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Michael, Michel, um, and uh, PDG Fresia, and of course, uh, PDG uh, Pedro. Um, they have uh, agreed to stick around uh, after the meeting. We'll wrap up in about 10 minutes here. Uh, but if you have any questions, uh, do stick around after the end of the meeting so we can have a nice discussion on this incredible project. Uh, thank you uh, very much again, uh, uh, Michael. Uh, so uh, it is now time for us to introduce our guests, um, and I know we have uh, several on today, in addition, of course, to our guests that you've already been introduced to, our distinguished guests, Fresia and, and Michel. Um, we also, uh, I'm gonna run through the list here, and if you could just briefly tell us your name, tell us uh, what you do, and uh, also if you're a Rotarian, tell us what club you are with. So I'm just gonna run down uh, the list that, that I have uh, on my participant list. And I'm gonna start with uh, Madhu Bishnu from the E-Club of Melbourne. Hello everyone. I live in India, in Calcutta, in Eastern part of India. And I'm the IPP of the E-Club of Melbourne, District 9800 Australia. So this is my second meeting that I'm attending uh, of your club and I really enjoy attending. So here am I and uh, one of my very good friend, Nancy Fleming, is attending the meeting also. So she just emailed to say that wish we were in touch, you know, physically and not online. And I'm very happy to uh, see her online and uh, wishing her hi. And uh, thank you for having me amongst all of you. Thank you. Of course, great to have you. And, and actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make you work for this a little bit. Uh, if you're going to stick around to the end of the meeting, would you be so sure. kind as to uh, recite the four-way test when we get to the end of the meeting? Sure, I will. Awesome. We'll put it up on a slide and, and you can recite it. Thank, thank you very thank much. Thank you. Great, great to have you. Okay. Uh, we have uh, Erlo Roth, uh, one of our uh, very own from the city of uh, Chicago. Uh, Erlo, please introduce yourself. Uh, you may, I think you're on mute, Erlo. All right, uh, let's, uh, let's get back to, to Erlo. Um, Roberto, uh, welcome, welcome back. Uh, thanks, President. It's, uh, can you hear me? Yeah? Yes. Thanks, it's a pleasure to be again with you. Great, great meeting, uh, amazing. And uh, stay home, stay safe. Thank you very much. Good, good to have you back. Um, Irv and, and Ruth, 
you're next. Even though Ruth is, of course, a, an honorary member of our club, but it's still like to have you guys introduce yourselves. If you just have to unmute yourselves. There you go. Oh, oh, you're back muted again. Oh, uh, Irv, uh, for some reason it muted itself again. I'm having problems. There you go. We hear you yeah. now. I'm yeah. enjoying your meetings tremendously. This is great. Just great. It's like a miracle that all oh, this is happening. <laughs> well, thank you very much. We uh, miss you, though. We want to see you in person pretty soon. I wish your meeting was three hours today. <laughs> We all do. We all, well, I do. I don't know about everybody else, but uh, I, I agree with you, Irv. Love all the people I'm seeing here. Well, thank you very Thanks. much. Irv and Ruth, always, always glad to, to see you, and I'm always glad that you guys can join. Um, very good. All right. Uh, Liz Goggins, uh, welcome back. Good uh, afternoon. How are you? Doing well. Good. Hey, I wanted to share with everybody, uh, first off, uh, my name is Liz Goggins. I'm from the Rotary Club of St. Croix Mid-Isle in the beautiful U.S. Virgin Islands. And uh, we have a Be a Hero, Wear a Mask campaign going on, and we've done these bumper stickers, which I'll hold up. Hopefully everybody can see those. And we've been giving those out. What we're also doing is... Um, on our Facebook page, we do a collage of Rotarians wearing their mask. So I'd like to ask everybody to send me a picture of you with your mask, with the name and your club, and we'll do more collages and put them up. Uh, we started last night uh, with the clubs in St. Martin. So I really appreciate getting a lot of pictures of Rotarians with their mask. So I'll put my email in the chat. We are working with our Department of Health and we actually have an Emmy winning um, editor and producer from ABC News who's going to put together a, a fun little video for us. So we'll be putting that up. But if you could send me a photo, we'd really appreciate that. And then you'll see them on our Facebook page and our Twitter page, Rotary Club of St. Croix mid -Isle. Thanks. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Liz. And uh, a few of us have wait, thrown wait, on wait. our masks as we speak. Right, let me get a, a screenshot there. <laughs> yes, take a screenshot. And we've even got Rotary One masks. There you go. I'll, I'll keep it on so you can take your screenshot, but I'm gonna keep talking so we can just keep, keep it moving. But good to see you, Liz. Uh, looking forward to seeing the result of, uh, of that effort. It sounds cool. Um, and then uh, we also have, well, I can almost hardly consider him a guest at this point. Uh, he's more like a regular member, but Salvador Farfan, good to see you again. Please introduce yourself. Hi, thank you. Thanks again for the, the introduction. Uh, yeah, I, you know, I came uh, a few weeks ago to, uh, to see how you guys were doing your hybrid meetings, because even though I'm no longer a member of the Rotary Club of Long Beach, I'm still helping them with, with, their, with their meetings. And, and so they're going to start to do hybrids uh, as soon as the city allows us. Uh, but you have such great meetings that I just keep coming back. So th thanks, thanks, for, uh, thanks for everything. Uh, a little trivia, a couple of years ago, we had our large club conference here and uh, Rotary One had some representatives and we had uh, a Duffy boat ride and it was just yeah. over, over my shoulder there. That's, that's where the Duffies were. So I uh, thought you guys would enjoy that, see that. No, that's, that's awesome. Yeah, I, I was one of those people. Uh, but okay, I ended up great. I ended up on one of the larger yachts, not the uh, oh, not the Duffy boat. Poor you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I know. It was, a, <laughs> it was a rough trip. It was a really rough trip. Uh, well, very good. Get, glad to have you back and come back anytime, Salvador. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, awesome. Um, and I want to come back to to Erlo since uh, you were on mute before. Erlo, please introduce yourself. Yes, Erlo Roth. I'm the current president of the Chicago Northwest Club. And our greatest challenge is to increase our membership. So we're talking to uh, some of the coalition clubs. And uh, later today, we'll have a meeting with, uh, with Len Dominguez, considering uh, to discuss a merger of clubs. We think that that may be a temporary solution to get the critical numbers to uh, re resume growth. Very this good. was a fantastic meeting, uh, excellent speakers. 
And we know that good speakers are one of the attractions of Rory. So we're creating a roster of good speakers that, that we may invite uh, as, time, as the time comes. Very good. Well, thank you, Erlo. And you're uh, certainly always welcome uh, to our meetings. Good to see you. Thank you. Sure. Uh, well, very good. Well, I'm going to run through our announcements somewhat quickly here so that uh, we don't uh, end up too late. But I do want to start out, first of all, by thanking all of those who uh, uh, really uh, stepped up and showed up on Saturday. Uh, we teamed with the Chicago chapter of uh, Kappa Alpha Psi, uh, thanks to our own member, Wayman Anderson, who's a, a member of that fraternity, uh, down at their facility in Woodlawn. And we distributed fresh produce, masks, and information on registering to vote. It was a successful event. I uh, want to thank uh, Wayman for uh, organizing that. We also had, uh, I was down there, uh, Bernard was there, Shay was uh, there, and I had uh, a couple of friends there as well. So it was a good, it was a good turnout. Um, speaking of volunteer activities, uh, we have something uh, through the first five Rotary Clubs in the world called the, the First Five Rotary Initiative. Uh, there is uh, eventually going to be an all-hands volunteer activity on November 14th, focusing on handing out hygiene kits and much more to the homeless. Uh, there will be volunteer opportunities on that day as well as uh, leading up to that day to help put the kits together, do stay tuned on that. I'm really hoping to have uh, your help on that. Uh, but before that, we have a first five Rotary joint meeting on October 7th uh, at 5 p.m. Central. Uh, so do check that out, it is in the chat box. Uh, we have some, uh, we have a great special guest, uh, Jennifer Jones will be there. Uh, so do, uh, do check that out, I uh, would love to have you all there. Um, speaking of great special meetings, there's a really great one coming up this Thursday. Uh, we are doing it jointly with the Rotary Club of Harlem. It's very timely. It's very important. It's on gun violence in America. Uh, it's at 6 p.m. Central. Our panelists have been there. They have lived it. Be prepared for a, a raw and passionate discussion on the issue uh, of folks from both Harlem uh, and from Chicago, uh, focusing, of course, on trying to identify solutions. We also have a couple of fundraisers coming up with organizations that we support and team with. One is for the Boy Scouts of America. It's a golf classic on October 5th. We also have the IMD Guest House fall fundraiser, uh, which is free on October 8th. Uh, that information is in the chat box, so you can click on either of those links and easily sign up. Of course, we also always have our committee and board meetings, which are open for anybody to attend. Those are on our calendar, do check those out. And then there are other meetings coming up, a couple of which are, believe it or not, in-person opportunities. Uh, the first one is our round table. That's every Friday these days at noon at the Union League Club of Chicago. We've been getting great turnouts for that. If you really are thirsting or starving for, for in-person fellowship, uh, these are great opportunities in a casual setting for fellowship. And then on October 6th, we're having a hybrid meeting. Um, it's 2020, so you're darn right we've got the blues, right? Well, let's express that a little bit with uh, Fernando Jones. He's the founder of the Blues Ensemble and also the International Blues Camp for Youth, and he's a professor at uh, Columbia College. He's going to tell us a little bit about some of those efforts. Uh, he also may, uh, may play a few tunes for us uh, while we're there. So I think it's going to be a great event. It's at the Glessner House in the South Loop, which itself is just a fantastic venue. So uh, if, if you're looking for, uh, for an in-person event, uh, please do come to that. But don't worry, Zoom will still be an option for those of you who, who can't make it. On October 13th, we have the chairman and CEO of Illinois Tool Works, E. Scott Santee. Um, he is uh, also the, uh, the, the president of the uh, uh, Civic Committee of the Commercial Club of Chicago. So those are our fantastic 
events coming up. Uh, but alas, it is uh, just about time to wrap up our meeting. So as promised, uh, Madhu Bishnu, uh, we are going to move to the four-way test. And we're going to throw that uh, slide up here on the screen. And if you would be so kind as to please recite the four-way test for us. Thank you. There are four-way tests of the things we think, say, or do. First, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it, bring, will it build goodwill and better friendship? Fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Madhu. That was perfect. So again, for those of you who are interested in learning more about our service projects, please do stick around uh, to chat with our, uh, our team from Ecuador on that. Uh, but otherwise, meeting adjourned. <laughs>